The moving assembly line is the invention that really got the automotive industry going. But what if it turns out that the assembly line really isn't all that efficient? And what if it turns out to be the root cause of so much labor strife in the history of the industry? That's the premise of a book called What is Good for General Motors, written by Tom Crum, a guy who spent most of his career at General Motors in operations and who ultimately ran the strategic planning staff at the corporation. In other words, someone who really knows manufacturing and the automotive business. He believes the auto industry has pursued the wrong business model for a century, and that explains why it's run into so many problems. Stick around. You are about to hear one of the most intriguing and potentially revolutionary ideas of how the automotive industry should change the way it conducts its business. From our studios in the Motor City, this is AutoLine. Here now is John McElroy. Thanks, everybody, for joining us here in the studio with my special guest today, Tom Crum, the author of the book, What is Good for General Motors? Tom, great to have you here in the studio. Very, very glad to be back here. And also joining us, Drew Winter from WardsAuto.com and Gary Vasilash from uh, Automotive Design and Production Magazine. Great having you here, too, Gary. Tom, let's get right into it. You've written one of the most interesting books I've ever read on the automotive industry, and uh, we'll get into a lot of things, but one of the things that you identified is that the moving assembly line is actually a very inefficient way of making things, anything, not just cars. But explain in a nutshell, why is it so inefficient? To me, an assembly line is a bucket brigade solution. It's like when a fire breaks out, how do you get the water to the fire? Henry Ford was facing an inability to make more and more cars per day. He'd gotten up to 760, which a modern assembly plant only makes 1,000. So he was almost there using a very different system with Craftsman in it. And if you go back and study that system and compare it to an assembly line, coupled with having supervised engineers setting standards in an assembly plant and having done it myself, I can tell you an assembly line is not efficient. It isn't totally that people aren't working, it's that they're not adding value. Every time you walk back to the next car, you're wasting time. You're, you're working, but you're not adding value to that car. The most efficient way to build a car is in one room with a car in front of you, the parts all around you, and you just keep adding parts. The mechanic in your garage who takes your car apart and puts it back together, he very systematically takes it apart and then he systematically puts it back together. If there's nothing left on the bench, it must all be in there except the new component that he put in. It's far more efficient. So what you're saying is when people are working on an assembly line, they're, they're doing work but because the cars are moving, they have to walk back to do the next car, and as they're walking, that's all they're doing is walking. They're not actually doing something to the car. And then even at that, you can't just have them do enough as the car goes by. It's only going to go by their workstation in, what, maybe 60 seconds or something like that. Right. And as I said last time, it's, there's also a line balance problem. It's doling out the work in stations. The work is in segments. And maybe it's a three-second segment, but if you add all of those up, the average is only about 78% efficient. Now, there'll be some plants in the world that'll say we're higher than that. But I can tell you in the 80s, 78% was a target. So, so wouldn't, wouldn't your model then be that you would have cellular build of something like a car or a component, which then you could bring to a shorter line and assemble these larger pieces? I mean, because we look at the complexity of a car, we look at the size of pieces, it seems to me rather inconceivable that you could have all the material handling necessary to bring in fenders and seats and bumpers and springs and axles and steering wheels and so on, I mean, to each of these individual cells without having an, a build somewhere else and then bringing it to a final line. Okay. That's, that's the direction we've gone for 40 years. We we begin to buy modules. We have tiers one, two, and three. And in the book, I go the other way and say, no, tier one, tier two ought to be brought back in-house. Why don't you make, assemble a seat? Why don't you assemble the powertrain? Why don't you assemble the instrument panel? Why do you 
by modules. Yes, it's to minimize the number of people on that assembly line and look like your hours per car goal is getting better and better. But in fact, we've gone overboard. We've gone too far. Rethink it. And as I talk in the book, no, you can't do it all in one room. You're right. It's too crowded to bring everything into one room. That's why I talk about a moving room or a, a moving platform. You move the car and the people and the parts. So yeah, you, you take on shopping carts of components that are reasonable distance away to handle. And you move into an area where you have the tools and fixtures and you can even step off and do a tire mounting or a, a tube bending or something and put it on the car. But this room goes to different areas where there are tooling and it ends up at road and roll test. So the people who put it together get feedback instantly. I just put it together and it doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? What does the readout say? All right, I, I didn't put the harness in right under the rear seat. Okay, I won't ever do that again. I just learned something, how I could make a mistake. It's a learning environment when you build the whole thing in one place. And if you manufacture it adjacent to it, then you know that that manufacturing machine is performing or not performing because you get an instant feedback. It isn't on a ship traveling from some foreign country and you've got shiploads of it when you figure out, oh, well, the hole's supposed to be on the other side. And I know that sounds crazy, but having worked on recalls on transmissions, I can tell you there are some stupid things that happen. Well, I, I really connected with your book, Tom. I mean, I, I, um, uh, I was in auto worker in the 70s, and, and, and I know what it's like uh, uh, to be a zombie knocking out parts and, and uh, getting yelled at if you made too, too few, too many, and, 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 and just with this regimented assembly line mentality. Um, but I, I just have to ask you, when we see some of the most revered companies in the world, I'm talking consumer electronics companies, Apple, Hewlett-Packard, uh, the companies with the great uh, stock values and, and, and uh, so recognized throughout the world. I mean, I see them making all the same mass production mistakes that General Motors and the auto industry have been making for, for 50 years. I mean, they have suppliers that are, you know, having their workers uh, sign uh, pledges not to commit suicide at work because they're you know, in this horribly regimented mass production uh, a, a mentality in society. So, I mean, how do you, or how does even the auto industry say, look, guys, you're doing this, we've been down this road, it doesn't work. You, you, you've got to try another thing when, when these companies are making zillions of dollars and everyone thinks they're, they're doing everything right. How do you get these guys to back up and to rethink how they're making all their, their parts and infrastructure? Um... There are, a computer is not an automobile, so walking back to the next one is not a factor. But the principles, the other principles in the book will hopefully draw you into questioning what did we buy in the way of automation and how universal is it? When my grandfathers bought equipment, they spent money on equipment. They didn't buy a throwaway. They bought something that would last 20 or 30 years. I remember seeing brass tags in Chevrolet and Happy Valley, we talked about earlier, that's no longer there, from 1910. And this is 1964, 54 years. They're still using that piece of equipment. There is automation that you can buy, and with today's technology and computers, it will make anything. Those are the sound investments, the ones that only make the 13-inch laptop and only this model, and if you need a new model, you've got to go buy a new machine. Um, that helps if you're in the scale race. You know, you, you make it look like it's far too costly to get in this game without selling a million a month. But in fact, no, if you buy different equipment, smaller niche players can get into the game. You'll have a greater variety of product, You'll have a custom product. You'll... There are things that we don't have that we had 100 years ago. A custom carriage, they were all custom. 
you could get one to suit your your pair of trotters, the draw height, the color, the, the shape, the size of your family, your family's favorite fabric and upholstery. And but we couldn't afford that. I mean, it, it, I mean, that was for the few, and mass production brought the availability of, of Chevys and Fords to all of us, that we could afford that. Okay. And, and even today, I mean, if you look at local motors, which is essentially trying yes. a, a model of what you're talking about here, I mean, even they make it very clear that this is custom building for the enthusiast, not, you know, the person who wants to go to work tomorrow morning. I will see them in November. They've invited me to come out. Um, understand that they're, they're building a modular tubular frame that can be custom mm -hmm. welded together. That's a good step in the right direction. But you don't have to just build a Rolls-Royce or top of the name camera. If you apply those principles to lower priced goods, you can also do very well. Well, I would have to think this would be applicable to electric cars. Some of these new, some of the, the, the new vehicles and, and architectures that are coming along, where you, mm -hmm. you have lower volumes. Um, and and had, how much work have you done, or, or how much potential do you think there? I would think would be an ideal place to start in the auto industry, is is, is some where, where you have alternative powertrains. I agree wholeheartedly, and I I look forward to that because. There are going to be different regions and different environments where you're going to want different alternative fuels, alternative powertrains. Um, there are a couple projects that I'm beginning to advise that uh, there are ways to build a factory that can offer 10 different kinds of propulsion. And I don't just mean different sized batteries. I mean alternatives that are locally available. Now you've got to design the whole car around that change, uh, but that's possible too. Because General Motors had that skateboard concept, I think they called it, where it was it was a uh, uh, plant. It was uh, no the autonomy vehicle that had the, oh, the fuel oh, oh, cell built yeah, right yeah, into the yeah, chassis. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and you could you could I, mean, I think it was a skateboard, and, and some of that right. has with the Volt, I think, where. It's the architecture allows you to pretty much, you can make it a hydrogen powered vehicle or a uh, uh, battery powered or whatnot. Where or diesel or gasoline, yeah. Or, yeah, you can drop yeah. in any kind of power. Is plant. that, I mean, is, is that more along the lines of, of, of something you know, that you think could work and, and that is headed in the right direction or is that still not, not the right way to go? If, no, if, if it begins to offer a variety and it's scalable, scale down, and it becomes local, uh, all of those are moves in the right direction. But to mass produce something and ship it all over the world, that's a business model that, that doesn't favor industrial competitiveness. You've got to convince people that the sunglasses they need are on that revolving rack at the, at the gas station. They don't buy them. Yeah, they're there. They're only $2, and they'll go down the store and spend $200 to get what they want. Now, the optical shops, 50 years ago, you run around with tape yeah. right here until you could yep. get them fixed. When I was a kid, that's, that was common. And two weeks later, you show up with, you got new glasses. And today, an optical shop, he's, he's got the equipment. He can grind it right there. You pick the frame, they'll pick the, the glass that goes with it. Yeah, they have to shape it a little bit and grind your prescription in it. Here it is, in an hour. And I'll See, bet you the margins are a lot higher on that than there are in an automobile. Margins are higher than, oh yeah. Glasses, yes. fine glasses, yeah, I good point. know that they're, yeah. so. And that's what I love what you're talking about, Tom, is you're talking about mass production, but not out of gigantic industrial facilities. You're talking about lots of little facilities that do everything in-house. And that's the other thing that I love is in an industry that has been chasing or, or going away from vertical integration for almost a century now. You're saying, no, 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 go back to vertical integration. Do it all in-house. Why pay profit margins to all your suppliers? Why don't you capture that profit margin? But my question is, where do you draw the line? Because there's certain technologies that it makes sense to sell them to as many customers as possible to get a good price. Uh, 
For example, uh, I'll just say engine computers. They're computers. They have microprocessors and everything in, in, like that. Here Doesn't it make more sense yeah. to, to buy those technologies from a supplier than to try to do that in-house? So how do you draw the line as to what you make in-house and what you buy? It depends upon the process, like Libby Owens for glass. Okay? If you go through that factory, you realize, well, we keep running it and breaking it and putting it back in until we get the process where we're laying in the, the laminate between the layers and everything's perfect and it's clear and, and then we just run the heck out of it. That's, that's a high scale process. There's no easy way to scale that down. But if you're talking about steel mills and what the mini mills did yeah. to them in the 70s, yeah, you make a whole furnace full of one chemistry. And I did that buyer routine where the dye room needs an obscure chemistry. They need some, some pieces for this dye. You're calling every steel yard you can find. Who still has one? Because they haven't run it for two years. They're getting ready to run it, but I need it right now. So along come the mini mills and they mix your chemistry in a ladle full. And so it's always available. They'll make it to order. There's, there's a different intellect required. There's a lower cost. The cost of storing that for two years and setting it. I say, let, let's go back to rethink the scale. And on the things that can be scaled down, go down, things like glass or something, maybe glass they can now. But, but, but we were talking earlier about your experience at Hydromatic. And if we take a transmission and we take the transmission apart and we look at all those pieces and we realize all the different types of machines that are involved from, from making the gears to machining the case, okay? Now, is that something that you could see that you'd be building in a cellular area? And, and how would you amortize the cost of that? Okay. In a transmission, having worked at Hydromatic for six years and being in charge of their industrial engineering group, I knew every process in the building. And I can tell you, we made 26 of the components of that transmission, maybe a little more, including the torque converter. Um, all in one building, could it be scaled down? Yes. And with today's technology, there's no reason why you couldn't buy a torque converter manufacturing department that would make any size, any volume, any torque requirement, welded or unwelded veins. Um, Hydromatic was making its own valves, and yeah, there were a lot of financial, let's outsource that. I can buy that for one and a half cents and cost two cents to make it here. Yeah, well, if it doesn't work in transmission test, you walk back and say, change this, and, and I've got two bins of inventory between me and the machine that was making it, boom, they're out, we, I got a brand new one, and away we go again. Well, I know, I, I, in reading your book, too, a couple of things when you talked about all the, the outsourcing of machine tools and whatnot, and I remember writing about Honda and talking to Honda about how they make most of their own machine tools in-house. And um, that, Good point. That, that kind of uh, resonated with me thinking, oh, yeah, now I see why they did that. Right. Yeah. Um, and, they also and, assemble all their instrument panels in-house. Honda does. Yeah. Everybody else buys it from a supplier. Honda believes that they're going to get better quality and have, to your point, much better feedback if there's any kind of a problem. They're, they're doing it in-house not just to save costs, but to keep their quality up. Yeah. But, but to be fair to the machine tool builders, Honda only makes machines that are specifically to their process that they need something special will be done. Otherwise, they buy the same machine tools that anybody does. They buy Motoman robots well, okay, like we can yeah, all buy. Yeah. I mean, it's just, but, but yeah, they have, they have uh, deep knowledge, as Deming would say, about process. Okay, they get that, they understand that. But, but by and large, anybody in the world can buy what they've got. Tom, we're only skimming the surfaces of the things that you raise in your book, but one thing I find fascinating is that you say, when Henry Ford, if you go back to, you know, 1910, 1911, he had an army of uh, journeymen, you know, uh, electricians and carpenters and millwrights and tinsmiths and all that. And when the moving assembly line came in and all they did was stand in one place and do the same repetitive tasks, most of them just quit. 
And so you no longer went to work because of pride. You had this craft and you would graze your standard of living as you learned more skills. You just went to stand in that one spot to get a paycheck. In fact, that's why Henry Ford started the $5 day. And if you only were going to work to get a paycheck and you wanted more money and the company wasn't going to get it, well, you were going to form a union and you were going to pry that money out of them. So what you're really talking about is, is more than just uh, changing the assembly line. You're talking about an entirely new business model for industry. Yes, exactly. John's, you've read the book. <laughs> well, and, and this is why after 100 years of evolution of mass production, we still now have workers in, in, in parts of the world committing suicide from, from, because it hasn't changed much, you know? There's got to be some sort of evolution here. Hopefully you're a part of it. I hope, I hope it can happen. I hope it can happen too. All I can do is try and tell a story of how it evolved and how some of the decisions, all of the decisions, that were the right decision for the time. If I was standing there with that situation, how on earth do I get more cars out of Hampton or Highland Park, I would have agreed, I would have done the same thing. Though Ford said no for two years, hoping his craftsman would come up with a way to get more cars out the door, he finally said yes. When he did, 12 of his 14,000 employees walked out in 90 days. They quit. They said, no, I'm a craftsman and I'm not going to stand here and just put in Five bolts, five bolts. There's got to be, and there is, a job out there in the carriage industry, and I'm going back to it. Because at that point, America's making 1.2 million carriages a year, and we're making 20 or 30,000 automobiles. The auto industry wasn't big. Carriages were big. Those workers went back to what they knew. But what came in left in 60 days, he raised the wages 15%, they left in 60 days. He shortened the workday and raised the wages, and they still wouldn't stay. So the following January, January 1914, he doubles the daily wage. Now, as I've since learned on book tours, there are flyers in the South that are, people are keeping that are saying, come to Detroit, make the $5. So what the carriage culture that was in this Midwest that came from Europe, because this is the Hickory Forest and the best carriages in the world flowed out of this region. The craftsmen here were the best in the world. They were exporting carriages that Detroit doesn't talk about, but we should. The craftsmen are still here. Their genetic material is still here. The people who came for the $5, they didn't have the same aspiration for craft and skill. They came for the money. And yeah, that my grandfathers talk about that being oil and water. It just, there were two different cultures in Flint. It just didn't work. Um, so if we have a whole lot of water now, do we have enough oil? <laughs> and in book signings, I, am, I love to go to them because they stand up and they say something or they come up after, they're still here. They're just itching. Oh, I do these in my garage. I build these at home. I like these. I just like to be able to really build something. So we still have a craft culture in this country. It's just sort of moribund right now. It doesn't have a job. Give it a job. And that's, I'm also talking about jobs. But it We could create would, a lot of jobs this way is what you're talking about. But it, but it wouldn't be a job working on the line as, as Drew was saying. It would be a job of making things. Making things. But you're talking about making them in teams, teams of, I'll say, journey people because it's no longer just men in the the factories like it was a hundred years ago, under the auspices of a craftsperson who can do all those different jobs. That's the way I think, if I get yes. it right, you're talking about how to make things going forward. Those craftsmen that made carriages had to interface with the customer. And if they didn't get it right, the customer would say, you know, this is what I ordered. I don't see why we can't make things at a scale where that local factory interacts with the customer. And if it isn't right, they fix it. If the customer wants something new and different nobody's ever asked for, you figure out how to build it for them, and you evolve as a nation to be making cars that suit your culture, and they preferred those over the 
stamped, rubber stamp products coming from Asia or Europe. Well, but, but that's how Rolls-Royce and some of the Aston Martin and some of the most expensive auto manufacturers do do that. Mm -hmm. But And that's what people associate with this. But you're talking about actually regular folks, middle class folks could actually yeah. buy a car this way too. Yes. Now, but but, but we that'd be awesome. <laughs> but we've forgotten as a culture how do we even order that? When I see a chop shop or a motorcycle, a conversion shop program, there's a few of them still around say, oh, I want it to look like this, and then they create it. We didn't even know how to ask, as my grandfather's generation did, for a carriage. How would you go down and sit down with a designer? The carriage builder says, tell us what you want. We don't formulate that. We say, I want one like my neighbor's. I want the, the one on the sunglass rack. I say, no. Somewhere in us is still that, well, if I could have it custom made and you can do it, I want this. And you might have to say as a manufacturer, well, you can save a little money if you do this. It's like designing a house or your wardrobe. Why can't you define your automobile? And with that, we're going to have to wrap this up. Folks, we've only scratched the surface. I highly recommend go out and look for Thomas Crum's book, What is Good for General Motors. It'll open your eyes. And I want to thank Drew Winter and Gary Vasilash for helping me pry some of this information out of time. But thanks much, so much for watching. We'll be back here next week.